Hi everyone. In this lecture, I thought I'll discuss uh, one of the questions which I had posted on LinkedIn a uh, few, uh, probably a week ago. And uh, it's a very interesting circuit. It's an idea that I had almost 10, 12 years ago when I was a master's student. And uh, the problem where I had, I mean, the idea that this idea was actually used in a PLL, in a face lock loop, but I've just given a, a simplified problem uh, so that it's easier to understand. Okay, so the main circuit here is, is shown in black here. So this is nothing but it's a transconductor and a capacitor. It's just a first order system. Okay, uh, this is the circuit. And I said that the capacitor that is used in the circuit happens to be a leaky MOS capacitor. So first we'll talk about what is the problem with the MOS capacitor very briefly. And then see what is this circuit shown in green, the circuit which is sorry, the circuit that is shown in blue doing here. Okay, and of course, I had asked, I mean, this is of course, uh, uh, this is a question that I was testing my students. So, so naturally, I just wanted to test some basic ideas in analog design. And what impact can leakage have on uh, an analog circuit? Okay, so again, uh, just to reiterate one very important thing, uh, which I often tell my students as well is that um, solving problems is all fun. Uh, I mean, solving practice problems is all fun. Uh, but eventually, and keep in mind that you are going to spend the next 20 or 40 years in this field if you end up choosing to become analog or digital engineers. So you have to really love this field. So try to gather as much knowledge and also think, given a problem, how to solve it. So this circuit is not just a problem which I'm trying to solve, but I also, also wanted to take you through uh, the process involved in solving engineering problems. So this is something very commonly you would encounter when you actually design a circuit. Okay, so it won't be like there'll be some textbook circuits that you'd be designing, but you'll encounter problems and you'll have to fix them. Okay, so that's the major part of uh, analog circuit design. Okay, so to solve this problem, I'll first tell, discuss what is the problem with uh, a capacitor? How is a capacitor realized? In integrated circuits and then of course we will come to all the um, the actual questions in the problem and how is it all related okay so first um, in integrated circuits when you want to realize i've given the capacitor value to be one nanofarad which is a huge capacitor okay so generally when we talk about capacitors we use a parameter called cap density so what is the cap density tells you how much of it gives you an idea how much of capacitor value you can pack in a given area. So typically you will have some area and you will try to fill it with, I mean, whatever, if you're building a capacitor using a metals, metal, metal and metal capacitors, which are called warm capacitors. Then we can also build capacitors using a MOS device. We know that a MOSFET, um, once the device is biased in strong inversion, it will offer you approximately the cap value it will offer will be the oxide capacitance. And that can also be used as a capacitor. And there are generally when you talk about analog circuit design, so when you, whenever you design an analog circuit in a given process node, whether it's 60 nanometers or you know, 45 nanometers or 28 nanometers or 20 nanometer, 22 nanometer technologies, most of the technologies will give you different flavors of MOS devices. You won't just have one short channel device. You will also have some long channel devices, often called thick oxide devices. So you'll have many flavors of MOSFETs available. Okay. So generally, if you, if most of you, if you have taken any basic course on um, integrated circuits, you will know that, you know, MOSFETs, I mean, any, any integrated circuit will have several layers in which circuits will be constructed. So on the bottommost layer, you'll have uh, the P substrate and then poly, and you'll have at least six to seven layers of metals uh, in it, within an integrated uh, silicon wafer. Okay, so you'll have six to seven layers of metals. Uh, this is typically for an analog circuit. You, you'll also have six, seven or eight metal layers. And for digital integrated circuits, um, you might have even more metal layers. Okay, so this is how typically uh, an integrated, integrated circuit will be composed. It will have a P substrate, which will be the bottommost layer. And then you'll have a poly, uh, which is typically used for routing gates. Then you'll have metal one, metal two, three till the highest metal. Okay. So when you take a die photo, photo micrograph. So when you take a photo of a die, 
what you will see typically is the topmost metals. So that's what will be visually seen. I mean, you can visually see that under a microscope. Okay. So what you will see will be the topmost metal layer. So if you look at any IEEE papers, typically you will see the, uh, the topmost layer there. Okay. So coming back to this problem, um, I mean, uh, for those of you, if, if this knowledge was already known, just ignore it. Okay. So just, just, you can just skip some parts if you already know these things. Now, coming back to this discussion, uh, if I want to realize a capacitor, I have many different options. I can use this metals and, you know, connect the metals in some arrangement to get a metal capacitor. Generally, capacitor is a parallel plate capacitor, two terminal parallel plate. So you can have construct a capacitor using two metal layers, okay, or some combination of connections of metal layers. So such capacitors are called mom capacitors or metal on metal capacitors. The other thing, obviously, you can use the MOSFET itself. So there are, as I said, there are different flavors of MOSFETs. The MOSFETs which are commonly used in digital circuits always happen to be the short channel MOSFET. So that is the MOSFET with the shortest channel length available. And then we'll also have a thick oxide MOSFETs. So typically, the short channel MOSFETs or the low voltage MOSFETs. So short channel, generally, those MOSFETs will operate on lower voltages. So again, this comes from critical electric field conditions where the devices might break down if you use higher voltages. Okay, the electric fields might become very high because the dimensions are smaller. For a given potential difference, the electric fields will be very high and that can lead to breakdown of those devices. So typically we use uh, low voltage device, I mean, lower voltages for low voltage devices. So this MOS cap, uh, the, the MOS device, short channel device is also generally referred to as low voltage devices. Now these low voltage devices, uh, I can realize capacitor using any of these three options, either a metal to metal, a MOS device or a high voltage or a different larger channel length MOS devices. Now, how do you know which is the best device to use? For that, we use this parameter called capacitor density. So it tells you how, camp, how compact the capacitor structure can be. So eventually you need to realize a capacitor of one nanofarad. Okay, that's the total cap you need to realize. Now, using these three options, I will end up getting three different areas. So the one with the highest cap density will be the one which I would prefer. So generally, the low voltage boss caps will have the highest cap density. So just to give you a number in 45 nanometers, uh, or again, this is something you'll have to find from simulations, but it will be in the order of, say, 15 femtofarad per micron square. So if you take a 1 micron cross 1 micron boss device, a channel length and width as one, say one and one micron, then you'll end up getting a capacitance of 15 femtofarads. Okay, so that's the, that's what this uh, unit means. A MOM capacitor will generally be two to three times smaller than a MOS capacitor, purely MOM. So this is, uh, in fact, it will be even lower than that. Um, okay, and the third option is a high voltage MOSFET. That will also be generally two times smaller than, two or three times smaller than, uh, the low voltage MOS cap density. So you can expect something in the order of 5 femtofarad per micron square for high voltage capacitors. Okay. So given all these options, your natural natural tendency will be to choose a MOS, a low voltage MOS capacitor for realizing capacitors because they will give you in a, for a given capacitor value, you will realize this in a much lower area. So for example, if you realize the same cap, using a metal or a high voltage mass, you will end up wasting a lot of area, okay? And area is premium in integrated circuits. You can use that area to build, to add on more functionality or build more circuits in that given area, okay? So we want to use a device which will offer me the highest cap density, a capacitor density, okay? In a given area, I should be able to get the maximum capacitance out of that device. So the preferred choice, of course, from looking at these numbers, we'd say, low voltage MOS devices. But the problem with the low voltage MOS devices, which is not there in the other capacitor options, is gate leakage. Okay. So if you take a MOS device, a MOS device, again, the physics for this comes from quantum mechanical tunneling. So if you apply a voltage greater than the, uh, greater than the threshold voltage of this MOSFET, there will be a current flow between gate a bulk in this case or drain and source. So generally, how do we realize a mom cap is that what we do 
uh, sorry, a MOS cap, is that we shot the drain and source terminals and also the bulk terminals together, and this becomes a two terminal MOS structure. Okay, metal, uh, uh, sorry, a, a metal oxide semiconductor structure or a MOS cap structure. Now you'll have a gate leakage is the current flowing from gate. Um, I mean, let's say this is connected to ground, then to ground terminal. Okay, this is a problem with integrated uh, with a low voltage MOS capacitors. You'll end up getting huge gate leakages. And this gate leakage is exponentially dependent on the gate voltage. After a certain voltage, initially it will be very low, but after a certain, once you cross a certain level, your gate leakage will have an exponential leakage. So I've, I've given some expression here uh, that is just to model the gate leakage. So I've given A times IS e power 20 into V minus VT times T by T naught. So here if you see this expression, V is the voltage across this capacity. So if you apply a voltage V across the cap, the leakage will be proportional to that. Exponentially dependent, that's, that's what I've shown here. And the gate leakage will also depend upon temperature. So generally when you design this analog integrated circuits, you normally design it for some minus 40 to 125 degrees or you know, min to max temperatures. And as you increase the temperature, your gate leakage can become significantly higher. Okay, so what problem does this cause? Is that one, uh, because it's going to take away some current, it's going to take away some current, the circuit wherever it is used should have the capacity to provide this current. And if you are talking about such huge capacitors, capacitors in the order of nanofarads, the currents that the, the capacitor is going to leap, leak can be significantly higher. It can be in the order of hundreds of microamps or even a milliamp. The leakage currents can be as high, okay, in some extreme corners. So whenever I'm referring to this, at very high temperatures and high, high uh, gate to source voltages. So this is, the, this is the problem. And not only that, because if you see your gate leakage current is exponentially dependent on voltage if you are going to use this capacitor in some analog circuit so most analog circuits will have some dc bias on top of it there will be ac variations then this capacitor will not only just behave like a capacitor uh, the leakage i can't model it like a current source okay so one might think that okay your gate leakage is just a current flowing from gate to source why not i just model it like a current source that doesn't hold i'll show it in a few moments probably in a at a later point of the lecture that because it has the current depends upon the voltage you will have to find out the incremental resistance so the resistance will actually be a nonlinear uh, value it will be a nonlinear depend nonlinearly dependent on the gate to source voltage okay so therefore we will define incremental uh, incremental resistances given around a bias point so that's what we are going to do in this uh, example as well so that's it. This is the basic foundation necessary to understand what problem are we solving in this circuit. So this is the problem. The problem is MOS capacitors, low voltage MOS capacitors give you very low, a very high cap density. You can realize the same cap, it's a much lower area. Okay. But the problem is they come with gate leakage. Okay. And that gate leakage can be significantly higher in some um, extreme corners in some extreme temperatures or if the voltage across it is higher. So this equation tells you uh, both the uh, the current, uh, sorry, the gate leakage current has an exponential dependence both on temperature and voltage. That's what this equation is telling you. So that's it. So first I'll, we will go back to this problem. So in this question I've assumed, asked you to solve for two cases. Uh, the first case is where the switch is open. So this switch is open. So this circuit is this circuit will have no influence on this uh, on the lower half of the circuit okay so that's what i'm trying to arrive at here so if given that we will first analyze what does this circuit do so first let's assume there is no leakage i just realized uh, this capacitor using an ideal capacitor and i have a transconductor of value gm so this circuit if you see uh, has a pole at dc if you look at the loop gain so this is a negatively fed back circuit. So you can easily see that if you traverse the loop, it's a negatively fed back circuit. And uh, the cap offers an impedance of one by SC. So the loop gain, if I traverse in the loop like this, will simply be GM by SC. There will be a negative sign. That is just to tell you that it's a negative feedback system. 
So now, if you look at the open loop transfer function, the open loop pole is at DC, omega equal to zero. Okay, so that's the only parameter that I asked. And open loop, oh, sorry, the open loop pole is at uh, DC, which is zero. And the open loop DC gain is infinity. Okay, because at DC, it's an integrator. The loop gain is an integrator. So the DC gain is infinity. So now to find the closed loop transfer function, I'll just do A of S by one plus A of S. And uh, because you put an integrator in feedback, you'll end up, I mean, you, you can intuitively see if most of you have done basic control systems course, you'd know that in open loop, if you have a pole at DC and you pl close it in a negative feedback, the, the root locus of the pole will be in the left of real plane. Okay, so naturally you should expect uh, a left of plane pole, a real pole, and you can derive that and that pole location will simply be gm by c. Okay, that happens to be the unity gain uh, frequency of this transfer function. If you plot this transfer function and uh, the loop gain and find the frequency at which um, the transfer function becomes, magnitude becomes equal to one, that will be your closed loop pole for the system. Okay, so the numericals are given. You can just plug in those values and find these values. Now, one thing you need to notice here is that, let's assume I apply a DC input, VDC, VIDC. Okay, if I apply a DC input, now this system, the DC gain of this loop gain is infinity. The DC gain is infinity, which means in the steady state, the error seen by this amplifier or transconductor in this case has to be zero, right? If it is non-zero, then there will be some finite current flowing into the capacitor and the voltage will keep ramping up. But for the voltage to remain stable, the current through this, the current that's entering the capacitor has to be zero in the steady state. So therefore, uh, these two nodes will be forced to be equal. So the output DC voltage, VODC, will be exactly equal to VIDC. At high frequencies, the loop gain reduces and the loop's tracking ability becomes poorer and poorer and this condition may not hold to. I mean, VO at a high frequency will not be the same as VI at high frequencies. Okay, so that's a basic thing, but I just wanted to, I mean, in, uh, just to uh, stress this point that the input DC and the output DC will be exactly equal. That's the important thing to keep in mind here. Okay, so if I the question I've given that the input signal is a 0.8 volt DC, on top of it, there is a one millivolt sinusoid. Okay, so I can immediately see that the output voltage will also be approximately, the DC will be 0.8 volts. We'll think about the sinusoid later, but the important thing is that the DC value will also be 0.8 at the output. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind here. Now, what happens if this capacitor is leaky? Now, we have to consider the effect of this capacitor being a leaky capacitor. So, if this capacitor is a leaky capacitor, we just said that uh, the current has a nonlinear dependence on voltage and temperature. So, therefore, I know the DC bias voltage of this capacitor and that happens to be 0.8 volts, which we found out from uh, the analysis in the first problem, okay? Approximately it's 0.8, okay? And uh, I'll say why is it approximately, but right now, for if I'm going to solve the circuit, I'll assume the DC voltage will be 0.8. Assuming it's 0.8, I'll calculate the incremental transconductance from this uh, incremental, sorry, conductance from this IV graph. So I know the DC operating point for this uh, MOS cap, which is 0.8 volts. Around that, I'll find out what is the conductance and take the inverse of it. And that I'm going to call it as the leakage resistance. So if you model your capacitor, you should also model this resistance in parallel. So remember it's a, why am I modeling it in parallel? Because this current which is being drawn into the circuit is like a DC current, okay? So at DC, there is a current that's flowing here and that current is dependent on, I mean, around the um, bias point, I found out this value. See, this leakage, actually, ideally, if you find the value of the leakage, it will be a function of the voltage. But I have found out its incremental value, incremental value at the desired operating point, which happens to be 0.8 volts. Okay. So again, I'm not taking the numericals here. It comes to a few tenths of kilo ohms. If you use the numericals that's given in the question, it comes in the order of, I think, ten, tenths of kilo ohms. 
okay so this will be the model for the capacitor the leaky capacitor you'll have to model it as a resistor in parallel and this resistor remember is an incremental resistor so the value of the resistor will change as your bias uh, voltage of the capacitor changes so that's what you have to keep in mind so now if i introduce this resistor in parallel with the capacitor what happens to the dc gain the dc gain is the, i'm sorry the loop gain is no longer just gm by sc now it's going to be gm into the parallel equivalent of this so which will be gm into r leak by 1 plus sc into r leak so this is your loop gain a of s okay this is your loop gain so now if you see the loop gain the dc gain is no longer infinite the dc gain is finite and that happens to be gm into r leak okay so this is why i was telling you the voltage is approximately pointed because now since the dc gain is finite the both the input terminals don't have to exactly track there will always be a very small delta error between the two okay because your dc gain is finite for you to get a finite output you need to have an error whose error will be given by p naught upon a okay so you can estimate that easily so approximately it will be 0.8 volts upon the dc gain it turns out for the numericals that i had given in the problem this gm into r leak value will be close to 100 it's 80 it's 80 or 100 that's still a big enough number so i can assume v naught is still approximately 0.8 volts okay it's not very high but still 80 to 100 uh, if you find out the dc loop gain it happens to be 80 by 81 uh, so i think it's 79 or something so it's it's close to 0.98 so i'm assuming it's close to one okay the dc transfer function gain is close to one which means v naught dc will be approximately equal to vi dc so even if you model the leakage the assumption that the capacitor voltage will be 0.8 volts still holds okay if your r leak is very small and where your gm r leak happens to be say much less than one i can't assume uh, the output voltage will be 0.8 volts okay so i can't make that assumption so that's what i'm trying to uh, tell you here uh, is that for this assumption to hold true gm r leak has to be much greater than one okay and it's the numericals i've given in this problem that condition will hold true. the second thing i've asked in the question is open loop pole that's the this is what i was trying to uh, ask if you have a capacitor with leakage the open loop pole is no longer a dc okay so leakage actually behaves i mean it, it alters the transfer characteristic itself okay so you can't no longer assume that the gate leakage can simply be modeled as a current source it doesn't do that in fact you can't if i used if i model the gate leakage as simply a current source which means the value of the current is independent of the voltage across it then uh, the transfer function will still be gm by sc i mean the loop gain will still be gm by sc but that's not the case because it depends upon the current has a nonlinear dependence we'll have a nonlinear resistance and so we define an incremental resistance here so the open loop pole will be one by r leak into c that's your open loop pole. this is a left of plane pole and the closed loop i mean the loop gain uh, will be a system with a finite dc gain and a first order pole so i think this is something most of you must have studied in any basic course so this is your open loop plot okay so this is your open loop plot so let's assume this is the 0 db line and uh, since your beta is 1 uh, the closed loop dc gain will be 0 decibels so you can expect the closed loop transfer function will look something like this okay uh, i think i've already discussed the significance of open loop and closed loop and all that the transfer functions you can refer to those videos and the closed loop pole will typically be uh, the dc gain times the approximately it will be one plus a beta times uh, the op open loop pole so the open loop pole is one by uh, one by r leak into c so that multiplied by one plus a beta so here beta is one so a is dc gain is gm into r leak okay and this pole closed loop pole will be uh, see because your r leak is not very high it will be slightly i mean it will actually be since your r leak the gm into r leak is much greater than one but still it is not equal to infinity it will always be less than gm by c okay for the previous case the closed loop pole when the capacitor was ideal was gm by c okay now it happens to be uh, this value 
and if r leak is infinity then it will approach gm by c so this is the problem it was changing it is actually changing the transfer function itself the leakage is actually changing the transfer function and it's also impacting the steady state error the steady state error is no longer zero here okay it's no longer zero there will be a finite steady state error you can think about it uh, because now the capacitor is demanding a leakage current right a capacitor for because it's a boss capacitor it demands a certain leakage current there is no one else to provide for that current all that current has to come from the transconductor itself the leakage current has to fully come from the transconductor so therefore that transconductor's current is simply given by gm times delta v delta v is the vi minus v naught so your delta v will adjust itself in such a way so that gm times delta v will be equal to i leak this is what is actually going to happen in the circuit okay so your delta v will adjust in such a way so that your gm times delta v will exactly be equal to i leak in the steady state fine so that's it this is the problem right now and it is altering the transfer function and it is also ensuring that the steady state error is not zero now in this problem it may not be an issue maybe let's say you have an application where you want the steady state error to be zero okay then this this capacitor will create a problem in the circuit that i was designing it was actually a phase lock loop um, and this capacitor's leakage was actually causing the steady state error to be non zero and which in turn was causing what we call reference bursts maybe when i have time and post lectures on pnls i'll talk about those problems in greater detail so that was causing reference bursts that was the problem so now how do we fix this okay the problem is that i just stated the problem which is the transconductor has to supply that current that's why the problem is okay because of the transconductor supplying the current the error there is a finite error but instead if we can create another path for this current which is not dependent on the transconductor then maybe i can solve this problem so then one way one intuitively what how you how can you think you see that okay the capacitor is drawing some leakage current so to fix that maybe i can just supply the leakage current myself by using a, by injecting pumping a constant current source into the capacitor but i can't use a constant capacitor because this leakage current will depend upon the dc bias so every time the dc bias changes then i should try to change the leakage current as well so that's a lengthy uh, that's a not a very trivial process so you need to somehow inject a current i leak so just to explain it in a little bit more detail if i inject the current i leak say for example if i am injecting a current i leak to the capacitor here then the transconductor doesn't have to provide for that current so this current in the steady state has to be zero because whatever current the capacitor is demanding i am providing it by, through a path which is not dependent on the transconductor so therefore in the steady state the transconductor current will be zero the output current of the transconductor is zero which means the input error will go to zero so this is the idea so the idea is i need to somehow inject this leakage current into the capacitor myself i can't put a constant current source as i just told you guys because the capacitor leakage depends on temperature it also depends upon uh, the gate voltage so therefore i can't simply put a constant current source so i have to put a current source which can track the leakage current so how do i do that so in analog circuits we often use this principle called replica principle so what we do is we try to emulate a similar circumstance that the main circuit is seeing and from that we can draw some infor information which can be useful in which in some circuits it can be useful in correcting for some problems in the main circuit so first step is i need to estimate what the leakage current is so that's my first goal if i know what the leakage current is then i can inject it like this like a current source i can simply inject it but the problem is how do i estimate it so this circuit which i've shown here is the leakage estimator circuit so that's what the circuit which is shown in blue is actually a leakage estimation and cancellation but it's first a leakage estimation circuit so this is a simple negative feedback circuit assume this op amp is ideal 
if you assume this op amp is ideal we have already discussed a circuit similar to that the output voltage here is also going to be v not the voltage across the capacitor will be forced to be equal to v not by negative feedback so this again is a negative feedback loop you can see um, it's if you increase this node this node will increase and this is a common source pmos amplifier this node will decrease so it has a i mean a 180 degree phase shift in the loop so it's a negative feedback loop so your voltage across the capacitor is now v naught okay so now what i'm doing here i'm taking another capacitor of same value and trying to ensure the value across the capacitor is same as the voltage across the capacitor is same as the voltage across the main capacitor by using negative feedback i've ensured that now the current flowing through this capacitor will be same because it's the same similar capacitor the current will also be exactly same so let's assume that both the capacitors are well matched meaning they are very similar in area so i can assume both the currents are very same nearly the same and this current is flowing through this mosfet pmos device so i'll call it i leak is flowing through this pmos device now this pmos device contains that information okay this pmos device now contains that information of leakage so therefore all i need to do is take this information and use a current mirror to mirror it so i just put another mos device a pmos device which is a current mirror which mirrors this leakage current to the output all i need to do is just push this current into a capacitor into the main capacitor okay so that's the fundamental idea here so all i need to do is first estimate what the leakage current is and then inject that current into your capacitor c then i solve the problem so this circuit is a leakage estimator circuit but there is one problem here the problem here is that to estimate the leakage if i end up using a capacitor of value c then i'm wasting lot of area so that's the problem i began in the beginning i said that to reduce the area we go for a mos capacitor but then if i'm going to use a leakage measurement circuit i end up negating that i end up doubling my capacitor area so which is unnecessary wastage of area so what do we do instead you don't have to use a capacitor c instead i'll have i'll use one tenth of that or for example n nth fraction of the main capacitor a one by n value of that capacitor and measure the leakage of that that leakage will be i leak by n and i gave you the expression if you looked at this the leakage current is proportional to the area of the device okay that's what i and some exponential term here it dependent on the voltage across it temperature and it was also dependent on the area since this capacitor is n times smaller its area will also be n times smaller so therefore the leakage current that you are estimating will also be n times smaller then i can simply use a 1 is to n current mirror so uh, this is here is a current mirror it mirrors n times so if i do this current mirroring by n times then this i leak by n becomes i leak here so therefore in the example i had given n is 10 so all i need to do was i just increase the area by just a factor of 10% 0.1 and used that to measure the leakage and uh, pump that leakage current into the main circuit so that's it that's the whole idea which i was showing in the circuit that's what the circuit is accomplishing okay so now the leakage current is properly pumped into the capacitor and that leakage current will track the voltage if the capacitor voltage here changes because let's say you change your input dc your v not dc will change if v not dc changes here because this is a circuit i'm using here then the dc voltage across the replica capacitor will also change if that dc changes then its leakage current will change and that will be reflected in the current that i'm injecting at top so that's the whole idea behind the circuit i am injecting the leakage current into the capacitor by estimating it using an estimator circuit that circuit this is it's am replicating the similar circumstances which happens in the main circuit in another circuit and then i am estimating the leakage current using that so if i am injecting this leakage current in the steady state the transconductor doesn't have to supply for any 
leakage current so steady state error will go to zero so that's intuition and also to prove that mathematically the steady state error will go to zero so recall because the, you have this capacitor we said that it comes with a leakage resistor because of this leakage resistor the transfer function itself was changing now i need to somehow show that this circuit which i have introduced will cancel out this leakage resistor i need to show that okay so that's what i'll show uh, in and probably in a few moments i mean in, in the rest of the lecture and then conclude our discussion now i'll take the circuit and then model we are interested in modeling the circuit around the operating point say at point 8 volts or some dc operating point so this is the output voltage v not okay i have biased this capacitor and uh, or, or let let me just tell it this way let me just simplify the problem let's say i have a circuit which is shown here this is what the replica circuit is okay so then if i have a resistor of value nr in the replica circuit the current flowing in this pmos device is simply given by v not by nr the output voltage is v not so this is v not here v not by nr is the current if i use a, a 1:2 n current mirroring the output current is going to be v not by r so i've just redrawn the circuit and i'm showing it here what's happening to the circuit this section okay so i i have a voltage v not here and there is a resistance in parallel with the capacitor so this is going to draw a current of value v not by r now let me just ignore this resistor and capacitor for the time being and see what is the upward circuit doing so let's say this node voltage here is v not if i apply a v not voltage here this current is v not by nr so and the current direction is this way it's flowing into the resistor and this 1 is to n current mirror will inject a current of value v not by r into this node v not now if you look at it if you have a positive resistor and let's say you apply a voltage v not across it you will be drawing current from the voltage v not okay from the node you will be drawing some current but here if you see you are injecting current into v not which means this circuit behaves like a negative resistor because you are injecting current into v not it offers a negative resistance of value minus r so if i have a capacitor and a resistor r connected in parallel the upward circuit is going to offer me incremental resistance of value minus r small signal impedance will be resistance will be minus r and we have already discussed if you connect two impedances r and minus r in parallel they cancel out and they give you infinite resistance so that's what happens in this circuit you have an r leak which is introducing a non zero pole at the, uh, at lower frequencies but that is getting cancelled out by this leakage measurement circuit okay so this leakage measure uh, sorry leakage cancellation circuit is estimating the leakage and cancelling it out and because we just analyzed it's offering a negative resistance that will cancel out this resistance and it will take back the circuit to what we analyzed in the beginning so this is what happens when the switch s is closed when the switch s is closed the leakage cancellation circuit offers a negative impedance cancelling out the leakage resistance and then restoring the behavior to what it would have been had the capacitor been ideal so now the loop gain will simply be gm by sc and the open loop pole will be zero the closed loop pole will be gm by c so that's all i wanted to discuss here and of course the steady state error becomes zero now the steady state error will become zero in the circuit okay so that's it uh, about the circuit um, i i know it's a lengthy video but i wanted to describe this properly um, so so that you you think so that you you are exposed to the kind of thinking that most engineers would carry out uh, when designing their circuits okay thank you